I think we should go ahead and get started. All right. Okay. Okay. Well, hello everyone. Our seminar presenter today is Joan Barreto Ortiz, a second year master's student in the Turfgrass Science Lab, advised by Dr. Eric Watkins and Dr. Nancy Elke. And his topic today is phenomic and agronomic approaches to understanding genetic variation for seed shattering in perennial ryegrass. Joan is originally from Ibagué, Colombia. The city is known for its stunning biodiversity, a factor that sparked Joan's interest in nature and science early on. A particular interest in environmental sustainability led him to study agronomy at the University of Tolima. He is the first person in his family to graduate from college. After that, he took classes for a semester at UFB in Brazil, one of the most important agricultural universities in Latin America. Well, there he heard about the MAST program. And through that, Joan came to the US for the first time in 2015 and worked on family farms in Green Bay and Isanti before taking a semester of classes at the University of Minnesota and working in Kevin Smith's lab. This was difficult at first since Joan didn't speak any English when he first came, um, but he enjoyed the challenge and was hired to continue on in the oat breeding lab after his mass program ended, uh, which gave him an opportunity to learn more about plant breeding. His current work focuses on the genetics of seed shattering, as well as the development of imaging tools to facilitate genetic studies in perennial ryegrass. In his spare time, he likes playing the guitar, bass, as well as cooking, biking, and perhaps most surprisingly, going for winter walks. Um, a brief <laughs> note, all questions will be answered at the end of the seminar. You can type them in the Q&A box at any time or raise your hand at the end to have your mic turned on. Thank you to everyone for joining us today. And with that, I'll turn it over to John. Thank you very much, Evelyn, for the introduction. And hello, everyone. Thanks for attending this uh, seminar. I first want to talk about um, the outline. I initially will give a background in what perennial ryegrass seed production is, then talk about abscission, which causes shattering, and for one I will talk about and how we measure it uh, um, in terms of uh, developing varieties that are non-shattering. That will lead me to my first part of my experiment. Then I will talk about uh, alternatives to controlled shattering, uh, agronomic alternatives in particular, and then I will uh, lead into my expected outcomes. So turf grasses are are spread all over the United States and, and the world. In the United States, mainly in, in, in main big cities, because um, people appreciate the lush green lawns uh, for parks or playgrounds and aesthetics reasons in general. But many of these turf grasses are multifunctional crops. Granary grass is one of them. This bunch type, uh, bunchy type grass that grows from one to feet up to three feet tall when it's fully headed is originally from Sandy to Europe, uh, Asia and North America in North Africa, but is widely cultivated all over the world, especially in temperate regions. Due to its rapid germination, establishment and wear tolerance, it's uh, widely used for home lawns, as well as sport fields and open spaces, uh, parks. But perennial grass is uh, of course a multifunctional crop in particular, it provides benefits for water conservation and quality, as well as soil structure and um, organic matter and carbon sequestration. But also because it's a nutritious, uh, very nutritious, uh, having similar or higher uh, energy and protein levels than many other pastures uh, makes it a, a wildly spread forage all over the, the world. Regardless of whether it is used for turf or conservation programs or forage, uh, perennial regress needs to be grown somewhere. The seed needs to be produced somewhere. And this is mainly done in Oregon, um, in the United States, but Minnesota is also one of the uh, greatest uh, seed producer, producers in the, in the, the United States, which uh, currently has 250,000 acres. The region in particular, Northern Minnesota, Rosso and Lake of the Woods are the counties where um, most of the production, or 80% of the production, takes place in Minnesota, and that's because this region has the the advantage of the the conditions from Lake of the Woods, which grant uh, 
grants a cooler and wetter microclimate. Although the large scale perennial ryegrass seed production in Oregon uh, has been performed seed since the late 1940s, and despite the successful seed production of other uh, several species in Minnesota since 1960s, the broad uh, adoption of perennial ryegrass in Minnesota didn't occur until the late 1990s. And this is, was mainly due to the lack of uh, winter hardiness in the species, which led to poor seed yields. However, Recent advance, uh, advances in agronomics and seed, uh, genetic, uh, genetics allow for production of pure seed as well as, as reproducible uh, yields in Minnesota. For example, uh, the resistance to quackgrass was uh, one of the main important uh, discoveries that allowed to control for this um, wheat, which uh, resulted in, in higher, uh, uh, higher production given this we contaminated the, the seed producing fields. Research has also shown that by planting perennial ryegrass with uh, spring wheat as a companion, uh, the spring wheat can be used uh, to, it acts as a snow catch, which uh, subsequently improves the, the winter survival of perennial ryegrass uh, during the first year of production. There's also been developments of uh, winter hardy cultivars, uh, turf type of grasses, as well as research that involves uh, optimizing nitrogen and plant growth regulators for um, which has led in increases from uh, that go to like 14 and 36 uh, percent respectively. In fact, um, there have been many other uh, discoveries or uh, research that the university has done for this crop to help the region which uh, once was a major producer of Kentucky bluegrass, having up to 5,000 acres, but this demand declined and then the, the acreage was shifted to perennial ryegrass. Although this crop has been bred for mainly turf grass characteristics as well as high digestibility, tolerance to grazing and uh, environmental stresses such as heat, freezing and drought, in Minnesota, the, the improvement has focused on seed production, which plays a, an important role in animal feed, sport fields, and landscaping industries. General idea of the seed production process starts with this establishment in Minnesota happens uh, in the spring or the late summer. And this involves a series of planting, field preparation, and, and year-round management before harvesting. When uh, harvesting occurs, the first step is swapping. So Athena is basically cutting the heads of the spike, the heads of the plant, and then placing them in, in rows. This happens during the cold night uh, hours, um, about um, until about uh, midday break to avoid uh, shattering. But it can also be done during the day uh, using multiple wind routers. In perennial ryegrass, mature uh, perennial ryegrass is harvested uh, or swathed in mid July to August. Then it's allowed to cure for one up to two weeks in the field until it's uh, combined. This process uses a, a combine, which is a mobile thresher uh, and seed cleaner that removes the seeds from the, from the grass stalk. And it holds it in, in a bin, in a bin until it's transported or transferred to a nearby truck. After combine, the seed, the seed is generally stored at the producer's uh, farm until it's delivered to uh, seed cleaning and condition plants, where it goes through a series of processes to remove foreign material or uh, seeds from other species that, or small seed that doesn't germinate. In Minnesota, this is uh, the Minnesota Crop Improvement Association is the official seed certification in the, in, in the state. Uh, after that, then the market, um, most of the seed produced in Minnesota is 90% is, uh, is for domestic consumption in the United States, but the, the seed, uh, some seed, in produce in the US is also exported to um, China, for example, for erosion control pro uh, programs, or Russia for pastures, as well as uh, Europe and South America for soccer fields, and even Canada for home lawn, um, for home lawns. Oregon has been the main producer of, uh, main seed producer in the United States. However, uh, there has been a decline in the area in the, the acreage. Uh, in 2015, it was estimated that 
135,000 acres were planted. And currently, there are approximately 55,000 acres. This is because farmers have transitioned to mainly other crops such as hazelnuts or hemp. In contrast, in Minnesota, the acreage has increased and is currently uh, estimated about, in, uh, about 35,000 acres. And the main reasons this has occurred in Minnesota is first mainly to the, the scientific contribution by the EOFM, as well as a high seed quality that is produced in the region, but also because the crop is very profitable. In fact, com part, compared to other crops such as wheat and soybeans that are grown in the region, the, although the costs of production are a little higher, which are estimated around $380 per acre, the profits are su substantially higher uh, compared to, to these other grasses, or these other, not grasses, but uh, crops. And it could even be higher. In fact, by increasing some yield, let's say in a linear manner, it is possible to have exponential growth in, in profits. Therefore, for us, for us it's important to know what does determine seed yield so we can um, contribute more to the economy of the Northern Minnesota and the growers of perennial ray grass. We know that there's a consensus that um, in fluorescent, in particular in grasses, in fluorescent, in fluorescent morphology uh, determines, uh, or this, the spike architecture determines uh, yield potential. This is a general uh, drawing of what a spike of perennial ray grass looks like. This, or I'm sorry, the, the reproductive organs, this is the spike which has spikelets that are like this one hold, uh, they're held by the rickets and they are inserted so like they're part of the cone, which is this stem. And this spikelet has florets and within those florets we can find uh, seeds. And a combination or arrangement of these structures uh, determines what the yield is, which in Oregon it's uh, estimated at around 2000 pounds per acre. Um, but in Minnesota, uh, given that the, the, the estimated uh, yield potential of the crop in general, which is uh, 10,000 pounds per acre, given that Oregon only, uh, although Oregon only produces 20% uh, of this potential, in Minnesota is only 8% of it. So for us, it is important to also know what are those causes of yield losses? Why is it uh, that we cannot produce um, as much seed as, as we could. And it turns out that one of the main reasons is seed shattering. Seed shattering is uh, it's also known as seed shedding or dispersal or dehiscence, which is a natural phenomenon that separates the seeds and the spikelets from the spike. You, so we have here some general spike again with the, its main parts. Here we have the spikelets and if we zoom into one of them or three of them, we have the rakes again, then shattering occurs because of the uh, partial or complete formation of a layer here in the abscission zones, right below the raquilla. And shattering can be uh, completely physiological, but is uh, of course exacerbated by passive mechanisms, passive uh, or artificial mechanisms such as that predispose the crops such as rainfall, uh, wind or agronomic practices, including uh, timing and equipment for harvesting. The, 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 what happens here in the abscission zone is that the, that abscission or fissure rupture uh, occurs because of several biochemical mechanisms that disintegrate uh, the middle lamella in the cells and, and in the cell walls as well, which leads to the disarticulation because of uh, weakening of the tissue. We know that sea shattering is highly influenced by the spike morphology. And this is not only in perennial ray grass, as there has been genes that uh, have been uh, genes that control both the spike or the inflorescent architecture, as well as seed shattering, as is the case of gene queuing and BTR1-A in wheat, as well as uh, CHL4 in, in rice. But there are many other cases in which uh, have shown the the control of both shattering and and spike morphology. So we know that shattering depends on the abscission zone. And there is substantial variation for uh, in the abscission or, or abscission in general across grasses. This first figure, the A, shows just a general model 
of what uh, how a position the, the general morphology of a spike or of a inflorescence. So you have they have the branch uh, with the spike lid right here, and then within here below the in the raquilla, these red dashed lines can are the sites where there is a, a, this the abscission somewhere is detached, but it could also be in other species in the pedicel or also just in the branch. As um, there are some examples here is rice and brachypodium, which have brachilla attachment at the brachilla or cetaria, in which the it happens at the pedicel. In perennial regress in particular, uh, this process uh, occurs, perennial regress like, de uh, develops several can develop several abscission layers in the abscission zone, as indicated by these arrows. And they start from the epidermis, then go through the uh, extending across the raquilla, where then the seed is attached by the vascular bundles of this, this plant. Um, and shattering or abscission occurs even before anthesis. Uh, during anthesis, uh, zero days after anthesis, we can compare these two columns, one that is a variety that doesn't shatter much, and this one that, I'm sorry, one that is very highly susceptible, and the other one that is contrasting. And the and this is just showing the progressions are uh, 0, 14, and 24 days after abscission. We know that after five weeks of antithesis, the vascular bundles uh, break, there is cell differentiation, and then the uh, further articulation of the, of the, the, the seed. A proposed mechanism for this, uh, there have been several mechanisms, but this is a generalized uh, approach to understand what, what the, the process of abscission is. And the main point here is that there are four steps for this to occur. The main one, the first one is the determination of the abscission zone. So it's from one normal tissue, uh, it transitions into um, uh, the, the differentiation of abscission zone. Then there is a response to uh, the abscission signals, which is highly controlled by hormones. And after that, there is an activation of the abscission, which can uh, have um, uh, elongation uh, of the cells or not. The reason there are two pathways is because uh, it is not yet clear whether this is part an, an essential part of the, the pathway or it just happens as a consequence. And then the later is just the the abscission differentiation of the tissue. Scientists, uh, as I mentioned before, this uh, is highly controlled by hormones. But scientists first identify ABA, abscisic acid, uh, as the main, the primary substance responsible for abscission. But uh, later it was confirmed that the, the primary role is in regulated seed dormancy and um, stomatal opening and closer uh, and their contribution to abscission is, is minor. On the other hand, auxins and ethylene are directly involved in the abscission process. Auxin, uh, which is a natural retardant, and um, ethylene, which is a principal accelerant, they regulate this process, but, in, but it's been, this process is also indirectly affected by other hormones, such as gibralins and cytokines. cytokines. In particular, ethylene has been um, ethylene, adding ethylene to the plant, it will uh, accelerate the abscission process. And it's been suggested that uh, perhaps using plant growth regulators or controlling this biosynthesis, we could, by, by doing that, we could potentially control um, seed shattering. Similarly, although gibberellins, for example, do not control the trade directly, they change the spike morphology in a way that does a rearrangement that could be beneficial for uh, to avoid tra the, 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 the trade. So for us, it is important to uh, develop varieties that do not shatter, so farmers can uh, harvest, uh, avoid seed losses. And to do that, to understand whether we can breed or not for this trade, we first need to understand the genetic control. We know that across grasses, shattering can be controlled by one gene, uh, monogenic, or many other genes, in that case, polygenic. For example, if the trait is controlled by, let's say, one gene, these numbers indicate the number of genes controlling the trait. There's just one gene controlling the trait. We could have, an individual can have the 
the version of the gene or the allele that concedes shattering resistance. So this doesn't shatter and this one shatters. If there are two genes, then an individual can have those two versions of the two genes that give uh, resistance to shattering. Then there is a contrasting one, there is something in between. And as there are more genes controlling, then we start to see a distribution when it becomes a little bit more difficult to differentiate what uh, the phenotypic or the, the how much uh, shattering there is in, for example, between cultivar maroon and cultivar uh, gold. In fact, uh, perennial ragrass uh, seem to be uh, under, well, shattering in perennial ragrass is supposed to be under, uh, seem to be under polygenic inheritance. And um, despite this uh, evidence, despite evidence and this, uh, it is better for farmers and sometimes for researchers to, instead of measure uh, seed shattering, just to classify it as plants that have high seed retention, which means they don't shatter much or they have low. But in reality, what there is no such a thing, just like an, uh, it's controlled by one gene, one or the other. So there is a continuum, uh, but we cannot uh, really accurately measure. So for us, it is important to know how much variation there is for, for this trade in perennial ripe grass. Is it, is it controlled by multiple genes, many genes? Is it um, qualitative? It's just medium, high, low, medium, or is there a distribution? To answer this question, we conducted a preliminary study last year that took um, germplasm from Europe and North America. And this was planted by uh, uh, Garrett Hennig, a, pre uh, Hennig, a previous uh, uh, grad student in our lab. Uh, he had here in St. Paul, uh, randomized complete block design with four, four blocks. And I went to, this is an aerial image, image uh, showing the, the blocks. So I went to this field during the summer and then I took these plants that still have heads, which are the plants that survived the winter. And then I collected these spikes, I put them in a bottle and then I dropped them from a particular height. And then I measured the amount of uh, shattering, that, the, the amount of detachment that was induced with this uh, mechanical process. And what we found was that there was substantial variation. This graph shows the different cultivars here that we used, and this is the level of shattering. The orange, more orange or reddish towards the right is more shattering, and the yellow is less shattering. We found lines or germplasm that shatter not much on average, other ones that had the opposite, and some other lines that were just all over the place. So for us, it is important to understand how much variation there is for the trait, but not just that. This, this is also called phenotypic variation. What is the plant? What's the plant showing? But this phenotypic variation uh, depends on several things. This phenotypic variation is made of the genetics of the controlling the trait, as well as some environmental uh, components, um, and as well as some interaction between these two components. The variation, the phenotypic variation, will then be defined by the variation that is due to genetics as well as that, that is environmental. This environmental component can be controlled with uh, experiments by randomizing our plants and replicating experiment, assuming that they have relatively the same environment. But the genetic part can be split in three components. This uh, dominance variance and epistatic variance, which is particular to the individual. And we do not care much about at this point. The main uh, component of variance that we care about is the additive genetic variance, which is that that is passed from offspring to, to uh, from parents to offspring. And by estimating this, we can then estimate the heritability, which is going to tell us how much uh, is the trade under, how much genetics are controlling the trade and genetics that are passed from uh, parents to offspring. And if we have these accurate estimates, then we can use what is called the breeder's equation, which will in general, tell us how efficient it will be to breed for the trait based on that heritability and the selection differential that we define. So if these uh, axis here is the parents, values for the parents, and this is the offspring, given this slope, which is the heritability, we can then select for a percentage um, a value of shattering for the, the parents 
and then expect some response in the in the offspring. But you can as you can imagine if this line is totally flat, meaning that there is no heritability, there is no point in selecting. It means you cannot uh, breed for it, or it's not worth to to do it. But uh, as you notice, these two have estimate accurate uh, accurate estimates of um, heritability and proper selection. We need to really capture this phenotypic variation, and this is difficult in shattering because it cannot really easily uh, cannot be easily phenotyped or measured. That's because it relies on visual phenotyping, which is subjective, time consuming, and low throughput, which means we cannot really measure it at a large scale. So, how do we solve this problem? During my preliminary experiment. I observed that the spikes had different shapes, even within cultivar, there was some variation for spike morphology. And we know that spike architecture, spike morphology controls yield, which is affected by seed shattering. And we also know that there is a relationship between spike architecture and, and seed shattering. So I, that made me wonder whether I could use then spike architecture as a proxy to measure seed shattering. This will be, to, this is an example for rice, the spike in rice of inflorescence. I will then look at the length of all these, uh, these authors, for example, look at the, the distances of these, uh, the length of the spike, the length of the branch, the number of forests, and a ton of morphological traits. But as you can imagine, if I do this, which will be accurate, it's still difficult because it will take too much time and it, it, it could be even more unfeasible than uh, measuring, accurately measuring the shattering. Luckily, high throughput phenomics has represented uh, an option that can help us uh, overcome this, this issue. In general, high throughput uh, uh, offers strateg strategies that can allow for the screening of large scale populations for a particular trait, let's say shattering or spike architecture, employing uh, using advanced robotics or high tech sensors or imaging systems, um, as well with uh, computing power. The general idea for this phenomic approach is, is the plants can be either grown in a greenhouse or in the field. And then from either they can, large amounts of data will be collected from um, either using images, uh, regular just color images or NIR or other soft or specialized images, as well as collecting, it's possible to collect data from the field using drones or other types of uh, the devices that can capture these large amounts of data. They can be then analyzed and, and uh, the, the images can get obtained and then analyzed and interpreted based on based of the try to find the biological meaning of this uh, of this data for the particular plant and trait that we are interested in. And in addition uh, or alternatively we could also use genomic data. This is to uh, look at where the, the genes or the versions of genes that certain individuals have and see how by having these genes or having certain frequency of these genes in a population, uh, we can use this genomic data with phenotypic data to make better uh, interpretations of the bio, what, what's actually happening uh, biologically in the organism of interest. This has been done in rice and many other species. This is a particular right, uh, example in rice, in which the authors uh, looked at the spike architecture and they also used genomic data and they found that cluster of traits rather than independent traits, instead of panicle length or the maximum, they look at clusters of traits using multivariate um, statistical methods. Some clusters, were associ associated to seed yield in rice and many other uh, morphological traits. This imaging technology has also been applied in, it's currently being applied in perennial ryegrass to look at seed retention or, uh, or uh, seed shattering. Uh, it uses some specialized equipment that uh, builds 3D, uh, has a 3D reconstruction of some images to look at how the morphologies uh, associated to seed uh, shattering. What's the relationship between these two traits? This technology, um, it can be sometimes a little expensive, which uh, might limit its uh, use in, in other breeding programs or uh, on other crops or in general, uh, might be sometimes difficult to be transferable. 
in summary of what I have talked so far before I go into, tell, before I tell you what I'm planning to do. We know that um, seed production for perennial ryegrass in Northern Minnesota is a very important industry. It has, it, and its economic importance or its profitability depends pretty much, pretty much on seed yield. Now we know it is defined by the spike architecture, so morphological traits, of course, as, along with other agronomic practices. But we know that seed shattering is high, uh, seed, yield, seed yield is highly affected by seed shattering, which jeopardizes the industry. And it's even worse because we cannot really measure this trait, at least accurately. But we also know that there is a relationship between spike architecture and seed shattering. So having said this, my research, my two, my first two research questions are, first, can we develop a reliable and transferable, uh, reproducible uh, high throughput system, which means that allows us to capture large amounts of data to understand the phenotypic variation for seed shattering in perennial regress. And if we capture this, um, variation, can we, uh, how much of that variation is additive? How much of that is uh, nature versus, versus uh, nurture? How heritable the trade, because the trade is, because this is ultimately what is gonna tell us whether we can uh, breed for it or not, or what will be the limitations for that? So to answer these questions, I will do, I will try to answer these questions with a series of objectives that I have. The first objective that I have is to explore the relationship between seed shattering and spike architecture. And to accomplish this, first I have to collect images. I am using a regular flatbed scanner that um, many of you might probably have in your office. This one um, in particular is a $40, $50 scanner. It's very inexpensive. We use a dark background to uh, increase the contrast of these spikes which will facilitate uh, further analysis. And this makes this the system uh, pretty much $25,000 cheaper than what is currently uh, being used. Once we have these images, then we want to process to uh, use um, image analysis or, or phenomic tool, which I have written in Python and I've been developing for the last year or so. And the general idea of this system is that one picture, this is how our picture generally, generally looks. The system will detect each of the spikes, then it will delete the background. And through a series of morphological transformations that involve um, mathematical convolution and other algorithms, we can then detect the branching patterns as well as these uh, branching structures that will tell us what uh, will allow us to infer um, about the spike architecture. We can detect then these branching patterns and then move on to detecting the number of spikes of spikelets and their location in the spike and their size and as well as their angle and other traits. This can also allow us to detect those spikelets that are shattered as this one compared to those that are not shattered like this one. So you can see that there is differences that can be detected easily by the imaging system. However, there is some improvements that we need to uh, make, for example, um, to control for false positives, which means uh, that there are two spikelets here, but um, the system just detects one as each individual object, object has one color. But there are also false positives in which there's no branching patterns here, but the system say there is something there. Those are things that can be controlled and, and, and they are continuously, uh, the accuracy is continually increasing as well as the number of traits. So instead of me telling you what are all the traits that I'm gonna measure because they are continuously, uh, continuously increasing, we can just summarize them as color traits, which are gonna tell us what's the amount or percentage of yellowness, uh, greenness and other colors within the spike and within structures. The dimension, which will tell us the length and spike length, but also those uh, branches and their, uh, yeah, just in general dimensional traits, as well as the relationship traits, which will tell us what's the percentage of uh, the proportion of spikelets uh, in the, I don't know, the middle part of the spike or in certain parts of the spike, 
what's the relationship to the length of the spike and so on and so forth. Once we have these traits, then we need to define what the spike architecture is. Mm -hmm. And this is gonna be done uh, uh, with um, multivariate methods such as uh, PCA, for example. The idea of PCA is that each color here um, and each, each shape represents a trait and each trait has its own dimension. And we will have a ton of traits, multiple traits, which means multiple dimensions, but not all of them really express or represent what the important part of spike architecture is. What PCA uh, does is that it helps us to reduce those dimensions to just some that are the more meaningful ones. In this case, uh, if I have, for example, 10 traits, then I'll have 10 principal components where my initial principal components are the one that explain most of the variation for the trait that I am looking at, which is uh, spike morphology in this case. We use this in a preliminary study and we found that that phenotypic variation that we measured that we induced with bottle uh, experiment or a test uh, method was associated to shattering. We used the principal component analysis, uh, these principal components to uh, in, using a method that is called principal component regression. So we basically tried to explain or predict variation for this other trait using this principal component analysis, these principal components. And three of them, PC1, 2, and 6, were highly correlated to shattering, meaning that it is possible that we can um, maybe use this system as a, as a proxy for C shattering. But uh, once we know that this is uh, an accurate system to measure spike architecture or shattering, et cetera, we just come back to the same question. How much of this variation is additive? How much uh, it is really due to genetics? Can we breathe for the trait? Or is it worth to breathe for the trait or not? To answer this question, we are going to establish uh, shattering nurseries. These shattering nurseries um, is uh, this is a field that will, um, in which uh, each block, each of the this is, this is a randomized complete block design uh, with four blocks in which uh, we transplanted a germplasm that had been selected for uh, cold hardiness as well as uh, rust. Um, tolerance from rust. And uh, what we did is we randomly made it 20 of these uh, lines and we created uh, half C families. So we know that from each of those 20 plants, uh, the pollen can be from any other plant. We don't know where it comes from, but we don't know, we know what the maternal genetics are because we are harvesting from this individual plant that has been identified. And then the seeds that from that plant are grown and they are all have seeds. They have the same mother, but probably different uh, paternal um, genetic material. The idea is that each block is gonna have three replicates of the maternal, maternal lines, which is three times 20. And you also have seven half seeds of each, um, of each uh, maternal line. So seven times uh, 20. These are a total of 200 plants and 800 plants for the whole shattering nursery. We then look at the, we transplanted this, then we look at developmental um, stages using Gustafsson's scale, which is specifically designed for cold season type of grasses. And, and we will, uh, and then when we harvest the spikelets at four different uh, times, just because flowering might be um, a confounding effect in measuring shattering and we won't need to account for that. We already collected the first, we already have the first uh, co data collection for this year. And next year we are trying to, we'll try to collect data from this shattering nursery as well uh, uh, as and data from a new shattering nursery that we have established. Once uh, we have that, we have those spikes, then we induce shattering. And the idea is that we want to uh, have quantitative shattering. Uh, and to do so, we are using a wrist action shaker. We put the spikes in, in one of these cylinders for five uh, minutes. 
and the amount of seed that gets detached by this uh, mechanical stress like represented by B here gets compared to C, which is the seed that didn't detach. So this seed was, uh, after shaking them, this was still attached to these columns. What we did is just we hand threshed them and then we determine what's the total yield and what's the percentage that, that shattered. With that, then we can estimate our heritability and particularly the narrow sense heritability uh, that is gonna tell us whether we can or not, or we should or not breed for the trade. So we have a high estimates of heritability, then it will be a good sign that we can breed for the trade. But what if we don't? What if we don't have good estimates of heritability? Luckily, this question has been um, always has been answered, uh, has been attempted to, to answer, and multiple agronomic approaches has been, have been uh, developed. Uh, this is an example in which they use seed moisture content to reduce uh, yield loss due to shattering. So the idea is that uh, cutting will be done when the, the seed, uh, the heads have a particular seed moisture, which is normally between um, 30 and 45%. It can range from 30 to 45% um, of, of moisture. And then it will give that there's a relationship between that seed moisture content yield and seed shattering the farmers can then determine when it's the time for the best time to harvest. Uh, in addition to this, there has been research looking at the uh, use of uh, different cutters, wind rowers, that have shown significantly significant differences um, um, compared to others uh, for sharing loss. However, this is a difficult approach for farmers because it implies uh, lots of uh, potential loss, uh, investment that might not be easy for all of them. Our idea then will be to use a plant growth regulator instead, given that they have been widely used in the turf industry, mostly to control heading, but also for lodging uh, to keep the plants straight and evolve and avoid falling. In this particular study, um, 2006 by Lee, uh, looked at two years of data in perennial grass and tall fescue and other grass. And it used plant growth regulator, in particular, AVG, which is an ethylene inhibitor. And by using a particular dose, dose of this trade at a certain rate, it shows statistical difference between those that didn't have the, the treatment or a lower treatment. However, the next year, they used uh, AVG again, and they also used TE, which is trinexafact ethyl, which is uh, an inhibitor of the biosynthesis of ethylene, well, gibberellins, sorry. And although there are no statistical difference as shown by the letters, the average uh, shattering was lower by using PGRs. They also show this study, this first two were conducted in greenhouse uh, conditions, and this next one was in field conditions. And they show that TE has in fact a statistical um, um, effect, and although AVG didn't have statistical uh, significant effect, it was still lower. The authors also observed that TE, in particular, changes the spike architecture. There's a dire direct relationship between spike length and shattering, as well as between the number of florets per spike and shattering. In general, the conclusion of their study is that the use of both uh, ethylene inhibitors, such as AVG, or gibberellin inhibitors, so inhibiting these hormones uh, had inconsistent effects. And there's plenty of literature showing that plant growth regulators uh, have been really successful in increasing seed yield in perennial red grass. But the, the effect on seed sharing remains to be elucidated. So we wonder whether there is any potentially, given that there is, uh, in, in the absence of improved germplasm, can we then use agronomic approaches such as PGR to control shattering in perennial regress? To answer this question, I will move into my last objective, which is evaluate the potential of these uh, plant regulators. This will first done in the, will be done in greenhouse conditions using just one cultivar that is uh, widely used in, that is uh, used in uh, Northern Minnesota. 
And we will look at the ethylene inhibition, uh, inhibition and also inhibition of uh, gibberellins. And we will apply these uh, inhibitors at uh, spike initiation and head um, emergent, uh, emergence. The first experiment, which will be conducted in greenhouse, will particularly look at trinexapac ethyl as a gibberellin inhibitor. We will look at three, uh, one, three, and five uh, grams of active ingredient as rates to evaluate the potential, as well as a positive control, which will cause the opposite effect, induce uh, gibberellin. The second experiment will instead look at ethylene inhibitor, in particular AVG, using as well three rates and a positive control that will be ethicon. The third experiment for, to accomplish this objective uh, will look at farming conditions. So this will take place in Roso, um, the Roso area, close to the Magnuson Research Farm at the University of Minnesota. And this experiment will include five treatments, which respond to two rates of gibberellin inhibitor, two rates of ethylene inhibitor, and water as a control. And we will do it in at least two locations, uh, having three replicates in a randomized complete block design. We will look at the spike architecture um, as well as shattering. And we will also look at the developmental stage uh, using the same scale that we used for the shattering nursery, uh, as well as looking at the chlorophyll content uh, and lodging and rust severity, which are common in, in these uh, field experiments. The expected outcomes of my research are then threefold. First, we hope to have a high throughput system, uh, image-based system that can be used not only for researchers to study branching patterns in potentially other grasses, but mainly perennial regress, uh, seed shattering, and the relationships between morphological traits and yield, but also by farmers uh, that will hopefully help them in making uh, more accurate decisions in uh, determining when to harvest, given that they use this uh, uh, visual phenotyping to determine when is the right time. This uh, system currently takes approximately 10,000 data points per, per like less, actually less than a second. And it can be easily improved to take way more data. This implies a large, large amounts of data that they can be used, and used to understand what's the physiological mechanism or the biological mechanism acting in the individuals. We'll then look, uh, we'll have insight into uh, on the whether it will be worth or not to breed for um, non shattering cultivars. Our estimates or heritability will then tell us whether we can directly breed for seed shattering, or maybe we can just breed for spike architecture, or maybe a multivariate trait, let's say a principal component one, two, six, the, the, this cluster, or just no breeding because there's just no, not enough additive uh, genetic variants. And if that's the case, our study also expects to uh, provide insight into what's the potential of using plant growth regulators to as, a, as an agronomic management to control uh, seed shattering by uh, inhibiting the biosynthesis of ethylene and gibberellins. This study in particular will not only contribute to this, but it could further be used in uh, other studies that are unfortunately out of the scope of my research, but they could be used for uh, differential uh, expression analysis in, in, in which one plant as a control uh, can be grown um, and another plant can be sprayed with a PGR that is known to control shattering. And then we can look at the genes that are overexpressed, uh, depending by the light green and underexpressed by the light red. And then we can look at when in the developmental stage that happens and which genes there are. Those genes can then be targeted to be for improvement of uh, the crop by um, uh, transformation or genetic engineering, which uh, using, for example, CRISPR-Cas9 system, which has been recently, uh, a protocol has been recently developed for lolium or ripe grass species. With that, I would like to acknowledge 
my advisors, Eric Watkins and Nancy Elke, as well as my advisory committee, Corey Hirsch and Walid Sadok. I want to especially thank Garrett, Garrett Heinick for his support. Most of the things I know about Perrin and Regrado, uh, I've learned them from him, as well as Don Melixson and Dave Grabstrom. I also want to uh, thank uh, Pam Rice, Michael Sadowski, and John Ferguson, who allowed us to borrow the wrist action shakers. And the turf grass lab, I I'm, will always be thankful, especially with the undergrads, Amara, Catherine, and Bailey, who uh, have done an amazing job at helping me with the phenotyping. And in fact, this couldn't have been possible without their help. As well as, uh, I want to thank Andy Holman for his you know, extreme support in field and greenhouse, as well as Dominique for his help with uh, developing the PGR experiment and Flo, Chris, and the other undergrads, Ryan, Dominique, uh, Nicole, Mike, and Inji, previous uh, former uh, member in our lab, uh, that along with uh, Gary and Shane have provided me with a lot of uh, insight and support uh, for this project. And last but not least, I wanna thank the Department of Agriculture, which is the one funding this research. And with that, I'll be happy to uh, take any questions. Evelyn, you're muted. All right, oh, thanks. Um, so everybody feel free to type questions in the chat box. Um, or in the Q&A and you can also raise your hand and I can open up your mic if you'd like to ask the question yourself. Let's see, okay, we have a raised hand and Okay, just a second. Um, all right, so Henry, you should be able to talk now. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, that's great. Yeah, uh, thank you for uh, unmute me uh, uh, and Joanne, uh, a good job on the presentation. I have a question on the experimental design when estimating the heritability of shattering um, so you have three maternal lines and seven half sib populations, right? Uh, my question is that, um, what is your take of, uh, did you use uh, multiple replications of the same genotypes within the uh, half sib populations or you use uh, um, the same geno genotypes uh, replicated in, in different blocks? And I'd like to hear your opinion uh, what's the difference um, between the two approaches? Thank you. Henry, thank you for the question. Um, actually, I maybe I, I explained this uh, well. We didn't use three maternal lines, but three replicates per maternal line. We used 20 maternal lines. And these are, since perennial regress can be uh, vegetatively propagated, we grew these plants in the greenhouse so the, the individual, the, the maternal lines are all assumed to be genetically identical. Those maternal lines, uh, three of each of them were in each block. So we have four blocks, and which is a total of 12 uh, maternal lines and the per, per shattering nursery. The shattering nursery is also replicated. So we only have uh, data from one location, but we expect to collect data next year as well from the same field as well as from a different field um, that will also have, uh, will also have um, the, the replicated, clonally propagated parents, but the half seeds will provide, will, will come from different uh, seeds that uh, were developed from the random uh, mating of these plants. Um, let's see if I answer. Uh, did I answer the first part? Well, in my, in my opinion, uh, well, there is many sorts of error here, and especially some errors that come uh, from the environment. And I think it's imp that's why it is particularly important to replicate this experiment, uh, not only to take uh, data, uh, second year data in the same field, but also in a different field. Uh, and I 
yeah, I, I think that the estimates of profitability will be, you know, we'll, from comparing those that the variance for the trade in the parents, which is expected to be minimal, um, but much uh, larger variance will be expected from those half siblings. And I imagine that, that will provide decent uh, estimates of um, additive variance. Um, Henry, did I answer your question? Is there something? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is something that I encountered when uh, I did my own research at Rutgers. Um, so uh, it, mainly I was uh, debating if I should use more seed from the same mother or replicate, it, replicate the same seed from the same mother. So, um, yeah. So you mean like replicate vegetatively, replicate the half siblings? That's right. Yeah, yeah. That's an I interesting question. I, yeah, I, imagine... I, don't, I don't know which one is, which method is better, um, you know, but, you know, I just want to throw it out there for some uh, uh, suggestions, you know, and discussions. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I, that's a good point. I do not have, I do not, my, my most honest answer is I do not know for sure. I will expect, I will suspect that it's better to have a different seed rather than vegetatively propagating the the seed, just because there is more, uh, we will be looking at more recombination events by looking at more half seeds. Whereas if we replicate these, we're just we're just looking at uh, we're pretty much controlling the, the those genetic components and then putting them into a different environment. But uh, it's kind of like the variance within family is fixed by replicating those half siblings. I personally imagine that it's better just to use more seed, different seed. That is great. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's Thank good. You. All right. And then we have another question here. I'll just go in order. What was the estimated percent of yield loss that was due to seed shattering, even though visual? Uh, well, we actually have not analyzed that data for the shattering nursery. We actually finished um, um, Lou, if, if that's um, what you meant, you you probably mean also in the field. Uh, in the field, it's really variable. Cherry losses can be just ten percent uh, of the of the yield, uh, but it could also be up to forty and even seventy percent has been reported in New Zealand, which is another big uh, seed producer. Um, it depends. Also, because it's highly influenced by the agronomic practices, it depends also on that management. But uh, those are the estimates. Yeah. Oh yeah, just in general. Yeah. It's very variable. That's why I didn't give out a number. And when I showed my, my data, there is everything from zero to 100% uh, shattering. I think uh, one of the reasons to uh, is just that to me, it not only matters what's those values in the field, but the accuracy of those measurements. Because uh, I can I can tell you by looking at spike, I think this is 30% shattering, but somebody else might think something else and, and who is right, I don't know. But yeah, anything from, you know, 10% to 70% and New Zealand. Did I answer your question, Lou? Thank you. All right, and then our next question here from Cindy Tong. As Molly Tillman just discussed in her PhD thesis seminar, AVG has antioxidant effects. Are you especially interested in inhibiting ethylene effects? If so, perhaps you might want to consider using 1-MCP if possible, or other anti-ethylene effect inhibitors that do not have antioxidant effects. Yeah, that's a good point. Thank you very much. Um, you know, I I know that uh, abscission is ultimately the result of um, ethylene and auxin production, which I, I think there is some sort of interaction between these two hormones. Um, and I, I know that some other uh, experiments have used uh, uh, MCP1, which I think, I'm not exactly sure, but I think it blocks the the synthesis of ACC, which is a promoter of uh, ethylene, um, a precursor of ethylene. 
I think that's a good point. Um, we are currently just interested in ethylene and gibberellins, but I, I have even discussed this with uh, Dominic Petrella, who uh, has helped me the most with this part, that maybe we will um, consider incorporating an auxin inhibitor as well. Um, I have also read in the literature that one of the main problems with uh, using auxins is that auxins uh, can have a different effect that, uh, sorry, I don't really have a clear answer now. I don't remember off the top of my head, but um, they can um, they can have some other biochemical changes that are also caused by other factors and might do some confounding effects when analyzing the results. But my general answer to your point is you're right. We should potentially look at, at that as well. And, and thanks for the suggestion. Okay, next question from Michael. Um, great presentation. I was wondering if there are any readily available QC methods for your computer vision um, model to fix the regions that are counting more than one spike, light green in your picture, or the regions that differentiate without a spike present, orange in your picture. Is this something that a human will have to go through to check to make sure the model is working on each sample? Yes. Uh, Mike, I don't see the question. Is it Michael Burns? Okay, yeah. Thanks for the question, Michael. Uh, I know you're interested in these kind of things as well. Um, there is, so our QC method, that you mean quality control, uh, it has to be, yeah, visually uh, contrasted with, uh, with the imaging system. We do not have an automated system that will uh, detect what are those faults and, and uh, uh, false positives and false negatives are. So it has to be with a visual examination of comparing what the computer says versus what the human is actually seeing. However, I think that there is room for implementation of uh, machine learning uh, algorithms here that can uh, further automate that process so that it doesn't rely. So yeah, we can just have a training data set where that has been validated by humans and uh, computer and then um, yeah, use machine learning approaches to, to do it in an automated manner. But currently we don't, we don't have it. Okay, great. And then well, looks like we have one more question here. Um, in the field, when do you plan on starting the application of PGRs? Just before the plants begin going to seed or sooner? Oh, good question. Yeah, so we, no, we are planning on doing it just uh, by a spikelet initiation, which happens uh, right after we see the third node. And, and also um, a second application will be done uh, uh, just when the, the tip of the inflorescence is showing up. We will do that both in the greenhouse as well as in the, the park con the farm conditions. But those will be, and you know, that is actually a good point. We at some point thought of uh, maybe using, evaluating the potential of one application versus two or different timing during the developmental stages, stage. But there is uh, plenty of literature showing that at least in primary grass, there hasn't been an other grass that there hasn't been found an, an important effect in using one or two uh, in like the timing. So that's what we decided just to use those standard uh, timings. Okay, great. Any other questions? All right, I think that might be it on questions. So thanks again to everybody for coming and thank you.